I bid you welcome. I welcome you to my house. Welcome to my house. Welcome to my home. Hello, horror hounds. Welcome to my horror house. And yes, Rachel, I've finally seen Colour Out of Space, the adaptation of the H.P. Lovecraft short story starring Nicolas Cage and directed by Richard Stanley. These two filmmakers working together instantly put this project on my must-watch list. The fact that it's a Lovecraftian tale is just icing on the cake. The fact that it turns out to be one of the best translations of Lovecraft from prose to screen is the added thrill of finding delicious marzipan just beneath that icing. Lovecraft has always been a tricky proposition to put on screen. So much of his horror is about the unknowable, the unnameable, the indescribable. The Colour Out of Space is a short story about a meteorite which lands in the Gardner family's New England farmstead. It brings with it an alien colour unknown to our spectrum of light, which infects all the flora, all the fauna and the minds of the Gardner family. So the first thing you think when you hear that this story is being adapted is, how do you show a completely new colour on screen? That's just a repackaged way of asking the age old question, um, asked of any filmmaker who tries to put Lovecraft's tales on the screen, how do you show the unimaginable and the unknowable? And I very specifically called Colour Out of Space one of the best translations of Lovecraft's writing to the screen, because there is another route to take. Adaptation. Stuart Gordon is a filmmaker whose name is probably most synonymous with putting the works of Lovecraft on screen. His uh, reanimator films and From Beyond. He quite wisely, I think, takes Lovecraft's material as a jumping off point from which he bounds into his wildly enjoyable B-movie schlocky madness. Stuart Gordon's most straightforward, I think, translation of the works of Lovecraft is his film Dagon. And if you're interested in what I thought of Stuart Gordon's Dagon and From Beyond, I've talked about those movies in separate videos and they're just a little clickety-click away. Before Dagon For My Money, John Carpenter's In the Mouth of Madness was and still is one of the most successfully Lovecraftian films out there, which it achieves through virtue of not really adapting any of the stories of Lovecraft, but just trying to invoke the feel of a Lovecraftian horror story. And now we can add colour out of space to this list of decent Lovecraft adaptations or translations. After watching the movie that night, I read the short story. And do you know what? It's pretty much all there on screen. A lot of the plot is compressed in Lovecraft's story after the meteorite hits. The color takes about a year, maybe 18 months to weave its infection around. Whereas in the film, it takes place over a few nights, although towards the end of the film, even that is cast into doubt when we're not really sure how much time has passed. Lovecraft's narrator is recounting a tale that was told to him by someone who at the time was on the fringes of the events, but the film places the narrator with this form of compression right there in the middle of the events himself as well. I'm actually really glad and a little bit relieved that I liked Colour Out of Space as much as I did because, as I mentioned a minute ago, I was an absolute mark for Nicolas Cage and Richard Stanley working together. And maybe this little bit of IMDB trivia will clue you in as to why that might be. Nicolas Cage and Richard Stanley have both pursued in their private lives individual quests to find the Holy Grail. I've documented my love for Nicolas Cage and his considerable acting ability without irony. You can check out videos for Mandy and I'm pretty sure I did a video called something like Let's Hear It for Nicolas Cage a little while ago. Again, just a little clickety click away. 
Richard Stanley coming back to direct a feature film for cult film lovers was always going to be big news. He directed Hardware and Dust Devil. For those of us of a certain vintage, Hardware is sort of one of those keystone movies, a little bit like The Crow, which really cemented the aesthetic and musical tastes of me and an awful lot of my friends. And then he was famously kicked off the set, ejected as director of The Island of Dr. Moreau in 1996. It was the subject of a famous documentary and he is of the belief that, that stars of that movie, Val Kilmer and Marlon Brando, worked behind his back to get him fired. I'd say he fires the last shot in Colour Out of Space. There's a sly little rejoinder where a clip of Marlon Brando is playing on the television. It's a little clip from 1962's Mutiny on the Bounty and a few seconds of Brando as the mutineer Fletcher Christian. A sort of little cinematic, I see you, we all know what you did. So the meteor hits, things get weird, things get weirder and everyone buckles in and waits for Cage to go nuts. So, and for those of you who only want that from Colour Out of Space, I think you get your 20 bucks worth. For those of you who want a pretty damn faithful adaptation of one of Lovecraft's short stories, I think you get your 20 bucks worth out of that as well. And for those of you who want to dig a little uh, deeper and get a little bit of subtext out of it. I think that's there as well. But for his purposes, H.P. Lovecraft was happy to just have something alien and cosmic arrive and fuck things up. That's kind of his USP. When I'm in the mood for Gonzo movies, I do like a little bit of subtext. I'm all for crazy for the sake of crazy, but that doesn't keep me coming back to those stories. Uh, I like a little bit of something going on beneath the surface. In an interview he did with Fright Fest, Richard Stanley recounted that his mother used to read him Lovecraft stories when he was a small boy. And then many years later in the declining years of her life while she was suffering with cancer, Stanley would read his mother Lovecraft stories. And Cancer looms large in this film version of Colour Out of Space. One of the deviations from Lovecraft's text is to have this Gardner family move to New England having inherited the farmstead. They're city folk who have moved out here after the mother of the family, Teresa, played by Jolie Richardson, is recovering in remission from breast cancer following a mastectomy. Julie Richardson, by the way, playing her character with exactly the same kind of steely focus and with an eye for idiosyncrasies that completely matches Nicolas Cage. Something we've come to expect from Cage, but there's a, there's a real partnership going on between him and Richardson. And throughout, I couldn't help but feel that rather than just some random cosmic horror shit that was happening. This meteor strike and the subsequent effects of it really echoed the, the bolt out of the blue cancer diagnosis that must have hit her and the entire family. Maybe a little heavy handed metaphor, but so what, it works. So while you see the effects of this invading alien colour on the land and the family, you get the impression that this is uh, an echo of uh, the stresses and changes that that illness and diagnosis must have put on her, but also the family as a whole, and highlighted the fracture lines that must have uh, already been there amongst this familial unit. And let's be honest, the insidious and transformative nature of this alien colour, it does spread like cancer. It, it, it metastasizes. So if you're going to make a film about an unknown new colour from out of space, do you know what? I'm going to let you off the hook that it's mainly magenta and purple. You can't 
actually invent a new freaking colour. The film looks stunning. Even before this alien colour takes over the palette of the film, the film looks great. Do you know what it reminded me of? Um, although they're two completely different films, it reminded me a little of Hereditary. Both of them show fairly basic domestic settings. Here's the house, here's the family, here's some rooms, here's outside. All of which are shot absolutely pristine, beautiful. The way it's lit, the cinematography, mwah, gorgeous. And then do you know what? We're just gonna expose the fracture lines in this family and start breaking this unit apart. And I love Lovecraft's original idea of it being a color, something so alien and beyond our comprehension. I mean, this is what he does. This was Lovecraft's job. The notion of an invading color. How on earth do you fight that? And do you know what it reminded me of as well? Just this basic premise. Did any of you watch the cancelled way before its time alien invasion TV series Threshold, which had uh, Carla Gugino and Peter Dinklage in it and Brent Spiner uh, about the sort of uh, task force trying to act in defense of an invading alien sound that was infecting people and terraforming the earth as well. Was it just me that watched that? And there'll be other moments in the film which will remind you of other things. Of, of course there will be. Movies, books, TV, plays, nothing's created in a vacuum. There'll be little moments that will make you think of Close Encounters of the Third Kind or Poltergeist. Definitely with this sort of neon pinky colour, you will be reminded of Stuart Gordon's From Beyond that I mentioned a minute ago. There's some monstering effects that happen a little bit later on, which really made me think of uh, Junji Ito's horror manga work, which I've talked about here on this channel as well. And it's not just the look of the piece. The sound design is crafted to really ramp up the stress and to kind of mess you up. There's lots of high pitched whines that start building and meshing themselves into the score. It is not a good idea with all of this going on to watch the film as I did with a stress headache. And everything builds to this crescendo. And for me, at least, it wasn't until that wave peaked and crested that I realised quite how cataclysmic all of this was getting. All of the sound design, the noise, uh, the visuals throughout the, the final act, most certainly. Everything starts ramping up by degrees, but just a little ratchet at a time. So I didn't notice it. Just add another bit, another bit, another bit until Finally, we get the crescendo and then there's a bit of silence in the film. And I thought to myself, oh, I think you said that all got a little bit loud and purple, didn't it? I don't unabashedly love it. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of what happens to uh, the alpacas, although I do appreciate the nod to uh, the 80s period of practical effects driven creature work. The idea that the daughter of the family is a practicing Wiccan just kind of sits there and I don't think it naturally weaves into the rest of the story. But do you know what it is as well? It's funny. It's intentionally funny. I know there's a certain demographic that will uh, tune into this and, and stream it just to watch Cage go a little bit nuts and they'll laugh and they'll they'll get what they came for at seeing that. I think there's something a little bit sly going on here as well and I think Stanley and Cage is sort of playing with your expectations as well about what you want from a Nicolas Cage goes nuts movie. There's a little sense that just like Jack Nicholson's Jack Torrance in The Shining He's a, he's a little off to begin with anyway, but he's a loving, caring father. I will say this, Cage has got absolutely no ego. I mean, he plays this slightly overweight, frumpy is basically the word, middle-aged dad who makes dad jokes and is a little bit embarrassing, but 
generally fine to get on with. And when he does go unhinged, as everyone does to different degrees in this movie, and this is going to sound strange talking about Color Out of Space, but when he does go unhinged, he's a little restrained. He's not up to the 11 that you might think going in. He does something, he internalizes it a lot more than you would expect. Very interesting choice. I think there's always something very interesting going on with every Nicolas Cage performance. And even just saying, oh, this is one of the movies where Nick Cage goes crazy or has the Cage rage. I really don't think those performances are all comparable. I, I genuinely think he's always giving something a little bit different each time. This Cage rage is very different to Mandy, very different to Vampire's Kiss. But I'm not going to convert anyone else to the church of Nicolas Cage. If, if you already love him like I do, you'll be sitting there going, Yep, yep, yep. And if you don't, you'll be saying, Andrew, you're, you're crazy. He's Ham. So part of the joy of a movie like this is to watch everything descend, to watch the entropy increase, to watch the madness build. I'm going to be interested to find out how much time passes before I want to watch it again, because the journey on the first watch is, is the most enthralling thing. I think there's enough there to make me want to go back and rewatch it for definite. Just after a little time has passed, after it's laid fallow for a while. I will say this though, and this is high praise, the movie was good enough that it made me instantly read the original short story. And then a few days later, it's made me order The Curse on Blu-ray which I've never seen before, but is a previous adaptation of the same short story starring the young Will Wheaton. And I enjoyed Color Out of Space so much that I actually can't wait to see The Curse and a different take on the same source material. So how do you like them mutated apples?